Chapter Ten of the House of the Wolfings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The House of the Wolfings by William Morris. Chapter Ten. That Carline cometh to the roof of the Wolfings. Now it was three days after this that the women were gathering to the women's chamber of the roof of the wolfings a little before the afternoon changes into evening. The hearts of most were somewhat heavy, for the doubt wherewith they had watched the departure of the fighting men still hung about them, nor had they any tidings from the host, nor was it like that they should have. And as they were somewhat downhearted, so it seemed by the aspect of all things that afternoon. It was not yet the evening, as is aforesaid, but the day was worn and worsened, and all things looked weary. The sky was a little clouded, but not much, yet was it murky down in the southeast, and there was a threat of storm in it, and in the air close round each man's head, and in the very waving of the leafy boughs. There was by this time little doing in field and fold, for the kine were milked, and the women were coming up from the acres and the meadow, and over the open ground and nigh the roof. There was the grass worn and dusty, and the women that trod it. Their feet were tanned and worn, and dusty also. Skin dry and weary they looked, with the sweat dried upon them. Their girt-up gowns gray and lightless. Their half-unbound hair blowing about them in the dark wind, which had in it no morning freshness and no evening coolness. It was a time when toil was well nigh done, but had left its aching behind it, a time for folk to sleep and forget for a little while, till the low sun should make it evening, and make all things fair with his level rays, no time for anxious thoughts concerning deeds doing, wherein the anxious ones could do naught to help. Yet such thoughts those stay-at-homes needs must have in the hour of their toil scarce over, their rest and mirth not begun. Slowly, one by one, the women went in by the women's door, and the hall son sat on a stone hard by, and watched them as they passed, and she looked keenly at all persons and all things. She had been working in the acres, and her hand was yet on the hoe she had been using, and but for her face her body was as of one resting after toil. Her dark blue gown was ungirded, her dark hair loose and floating. The flowers that had wreathed it now faded, lying strewn upon the grass before her, her feet bare for coolness' sake, her left hand lying loose and open upon her knee. Yet though her body otherwise looked thus listless, in her face was no listlessness, nor rest. Her eyes were alert and clear, shining like two stars in the heavens of dawn-tide. Her lips were set close, her brow knit, as of one striving to shape thoughts hard to understand, into words that all might understand. So she sat noting all things, as woman by woman went past her into the hall till at last she slowly rose to her feet, for there came two young women, leading between them that same old carline with whom she had talked on the hill of speech. She looked on the carline steadfastly, but gave no token of knowing her, but the ancient woman spoke when she came near to the hall son, and old as her semblance was, yet did her speech sound sweet to the hall son, and indeed to all those that heard it. And she said, May we be here to-night, O hall son, thou lovely Cirrus of the mighty wolfings? May a wandering woman sit amongst you and eat the meat of the wolfings? Then spake the hall son in a sweet measured voice, Surely, mother, all men who bring peace with them are welcome guests to the wolfings. Nor will any ask thine errand, but we will let thy tidings flow from thee as thou wilt. This is the custom of the kindred, and no word of mine own. I speak to thee because thou hast spoken to me, but I have no authority here, being myself an alien. Albeit I serve the house of the wolfings, I love it as the hound loveth his master who feedeth him, and his master's children who play with him. Enter, mother, and be glad of heart, and put away care from thee. 
Then the old woman drew nigher to her, and sat down in the dust at her feet, for she was now sitting down again, and took her hand, and kissed it, and fondled it, and seemed loath to leave handling the beauty of the hall sun. But she looked kindly on the carline, and smiled on her, and leaned down to her, and kissed her mouth, and said, "'Damsels, take care of this poor woman, and make her good cheer, for she is wise of wit, and a friend of the wolfings. And I have seen her before, and spoken with her, and she loveth us. But as for me, I must needs be alone in the meads for a while, and it may be that when I come to you again I shall have a word to tell you.' Now, indeed, it was in a manner true that the hall son had no authority in the wolfing house. Yet was she so well beloved for her wisdom and beauty and her sweet speech that all hastened to do her will in small matters and in great, and now as they looked at her after the old woman had caressed her, it seemed to them that her fairness grew under their eyes, and that they had never seen her so fair, and the sight of her seemed so good to them that the outworn day and its weariness changed to them, and it grew as pleasant as the first hours of the sunlight, when men arise happy from their rest, and look on the day that lieth hopeful before them, with all its deeds to be. So they grew merry, and they led the carline into the hall with them, and set her down in the women's chamber, and washed her feet, and gave her meat and drink, and bade her rest, and think of nothing troublous, and in all wise made her good cheer, and she was merry with them, and praised their fairness and their deafness, and asked them many questions about their weaving and spinning and carding. Howbeit the looms were idle as then, because it was midsummer, and the men gone to the war. And this they deemed strange, as it seemed to them that all women should know of such things, but they thought it was a token that she had come from far away. But afterwards she sat among them, and told them pleasant tales of past times and far countries, and was blithe to them, and they to her, and the time wore on toward nightfall in the women's chamber. End of chapter 10